life certainly is beautiful. If you think of a lifelong happy friendship, or if you think of a wonderful family day with several generations around a common table, or glorious natural scenery, or a painting that captures that fleeting moment when the moonlight is shimmering on the surface of a lake, or a poem that in just a few words gives a profound insight. But human life is never just beautiful. I think it's safe to say that we all know life and its challenges, its disappointments, its frustrations, its conflicts, big and small, its fears, and its illnesses, including the contagious ones. Christian Science presents a fresh concept of who God is, a fresh concept of who we are as children of God. This fresh concept of who God is can lift us above the limitations and above the discords of human life and show us who we truly are as manifestations of the divine and how we truly are. Always happy, always at peace, and always well. Mary Baker Eddy, the discoverer of Christian science, knew human life very well. And I want to tell you about Christian science or this practical knowledge of God. Uh, so I'll certainly be talking about that. And as a way of getting into that, I wanted to give you a bit of background about the person who discovered Christian science. She grew up in the 1820s and 1830s in the state of New Hampshire in the region of the United States called New England, where the city of Boston is, for example. She was the sixth in a family of six children on a family farm. As a little girl, she loved God dearly, and she delighted in her family. Because she was often sick, she couldn't attend school regularly, but she was intensely interested in learning. She was intensely interested in the world around her. She was strongly encouraged in her studies by her scholarly brother, Albert. She was strongly encouraged, especially by her mother, to put into practice the teachings of Jesus. At age 22, Mary Baker married George Glover, a builder, and together they moved to a very different part of the United States, to North Carolina. There, after six months, and in spite of their best prayers, he died suddenly of yellow fever, leaving her alone and expecting. She returned to New Hampshire, where she lived initially with her parents and then with a sister. When her little son was born, he was a handful. He was a wild, energetic little boy. And because she was often sick, it was challenging for her to care for him. Somewhat later, the rest of her family, concerned about her health and against her wishes, had the child taken away and placed in the care of another family. Of course, that broke her heart. And I think that it was one of the reasons why she wanted to marry again, to form a family circle to receive back her little son. She married Daniel Patterson. But their marriage was not a happy marriage. His income, uh, he being a, an itinerant dentist, his income was never regular enough that they could enjoy much financial stability. And towards the end of the marriage, he was no longer faithful. Although she worked at saving that marriage during more than 20 years, finally, she divorced him. And the family with whom her little son was living moved to what was then considered to be the far west, to the state of Minnesota. And he was told that his mother had passed on. She heard nothing from him for more than five years and didn't see him again for close to 25 years. Of course, we all have challenges. How was Mary Baker facing hers? 
by striving even more to put into practice the teachings of Jesus, by turning even more fully to the Bible. She knew that the Bible is filled with the promise that God is always present to help us in moments of difficulty. But how to prove that practically in the midst of poverty, loneliness, and ill health? During this time, she explored various ways of improving her health, including conventional medicine, homeopathy, uh, a system of healing that was very um, popular at that time called the water cure, and even what we today would call hypnotism. For a time, she used the services of a well-known mental healer, Phineas Quimby, and she seemed to be better, but only for a time. And finally, she was disappointed because the basis of his system of healing wasn't the spiritual and moral principle that was the basis of the healing works of Jesus. In 1866, she had a breakthrough. She was walking to a temperance meeting. That was a kind of meeting that was quite common at that time, organized to try to discourage the consumption of alcohol in society in general. This was in Lynn, Massachusetts. It was winter. It was in February. And walking to this temperance meeting, she fell on an icy sidewalk and because of the fall, became unconscious. She was taken to a house that wasn't far from there and the physician who attended her diagnosed serious internal injuries. She seemed to have serious internal injuries and a concussion and as I said, she was unconscious. And he didn't expect that she would survive. But she came too and asked for a Bible. Then, in a moment of great inspiration, while she was reading one of the accounts of Jesus' healings, her decades of searching for spiritual answers, her decades of searching for better health culminated in a healing. She was suddenly well, to the surprise of her friends. And although she experienced minor relapses over the following months. Finally, she was healed not just of the effects of the fall, but ever after that experience, she enjoyed better health than before. What had she seen? Later, she would write that during those moments of great inspiration, she saw that beyond anything physical, beyond anything organic or biological, was the reality of God as infinite life. And she was at one with this life. And in this oneness, she had everything that she would ever need, including her health. Throughout history, many people have been healed and then they've simply gone on with their lives. But she wanted to understand how she had been healed. Why was she healed when she was healed? Why not earlier or later? And could the good results be repeated in other cases with other people? Very logically for her, she turned even more to her Bible. And she was taking detailed notes on what she was reading. She found that with this understanding of God as infinite life, with this understanding of identity as being the spiritual expression of this life, she could consistently heal other people. And not long after that, she began to teach others how to heal with this understanding. The fact that not just she, but others as well, could heal with this understanding confirmed for her that the power to heal wasn't her special power, wasn't her personal power, but that she had come to understand the science of healing, the practical knowledge of God that was the basis of the teachings and healing works of Jesus. These healings, affected by uh, her and by her students, were strong physical healings, diphtheria, malaria, tuberculosis, but there was also a moral dimension to these healings, Often, the person healed felt uplifted 
spiritually. Often the person became a better person, less selfish, for example. By 1875, she had organized all of her notes into a book. That's this book, Science and Health, with Key to the Scriptures. In this book, she describes, she um, says how you can experience safety even if you're directly exposed to a contagious disease. She explains as well how you can be uh, protected uh, from, uh, in, in terms of preventing disease. And she explains how you can be healed of disease, including contagious disease, through prayer. But before talking more specifically about that, I wanted to read two passages that are perhaps even more fundamental. First, this one it says here, the Christ-like understanding of scientific being and divine healing includes a perfect principle and idea, perfect God and perfect man as the basis of thought and demonstration. She wasn't saying that humans are perfect. She was saying that beyond everything human is the perfection of God. And each of us in our real spiritual being manifests this divine perfection. Another passage, you can prove for yourself, dear reader, the science of healing, and so ascertain if the author has given you the correct interpretation of scripture. Someone who did just that was Asa Gilbert Eddy. And in 1877, they married, and Mary Baker then became Mary Baker Eddy. Speaking of demonstrating this science for yourself, I wanted to recount two personal experiences. One in the context of COVID-19 a little bit later. But first, about 15 years ago, I began to experience a very sharp pain in my abdomen. In reality, these were painful episodes that lasted two or three hours. Of course, I began to pray with these very ideas that God is life that I'm perfect and free as the very expression of this life. During this time, I was working uh, for the Church of Christ Scientist in Boston, and the particular role that I was playing required that I speak in public six times a week. But happily, these painful episodes didn't interfere with that work. They came on other days at other times. I was very grateful for that. Also during a part of this time, I received a visit from various family members. And had they realized I was experiencing these difficulties, they would have been very concerned. But they never realized that if I was with them and needed to pray, I was able to simply say I had work to do, which was not surprising. I almost always had work to do. And I could go to another part of the house and just pray. I was so grateful that they weren't concerned. In fact. These pains made me think of the experience of a family member decades before when the family member went to the hospital and was diagnosed with gallstones. Also during a part of this time, I received help from first one Christian science practitioner and later from another. And I should say that a Christian science practitioner is someone who dedicates their full time to helping others in prayer. Together we prayed, we looked at passages in the Bible and in science and health. I was so grateful for their help. The painful episodes stopped after about two or three weeks. They stopped until they came back again about five months later. But this time I was very much ready to meet them with a great sense of conviction of my present perfection, my present freedom. I was very much able to meet these fears and these pains with a great sense of authority. And those pains stopped. And they stopped definitively. As I say, this was about 15 years ago. Such a healing has as its basis 
a higher concept of who we are, a higher concept of identity. The basis of my prayers was that I'm spiritual as the spiritual reflection of God, the image and likeness of God, to use Bible language. Such a healing has as its basis a higher concept of who God is. Who is God? Christian science teaches that he or she, instead of being one thing amongst many things in the universe, instead of being one entity amongst many entities in the universe, that in reality God is infinite. God is all. But how can that be? How can God be all if we live in a world made up of things? Mary Baker Eddy found in the scriptures a sense of God as being infinite, unopposed love, the only life, the only intelligence, the only mind, the only substance of the universe, and that this was the basis of the teachings and healing works of Jesus. Of course, we can read in 1 John that God is love. Also, in the Gospel according to St. Luke, we can read what has sometimes been called the pearl of parables, the parable of the prodigal son. In this parable, recounted by Jesus, a father whose heart is filled with love, filled with compassion, accepts back his youngest son, who has treated him most disrespectfully, and who has simply gone off and wasted his inheritance. When the son comes to realize that he has nothing left, not even anything to eat, he decides to go back to the father. But he doesn't think that the father will take him back as a son, maybe as a servant. At least in that way, he'll have something to eat. But when he's going back, the father sees him from a long ways off, and the father runs to meet him and embraces him and kisses him. And the father says that he wants to celebrate because, he says, this my son was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. With this parable, Jesus is indicating the nature of God as unconditional love for each and every one of us. You could even say the nature of God is, uh, as infinite, unopposed love for each and every one of us. What Mary Baker Eddy was seeing was truly revolutionary and was challenging some of the most basic assumptions of human thought itself. She wasn't seeing that there are difficulties and discords and diseases, including contagious diseases, and then there's also infinite love. She was seeing that infinite love is so infinite that it actually exists instead of an imperfect material universe. To be put in other words, she wasn't seeing that there is a basic human context in which suffering is normal, natural, and inevitable for each and every one of us, and then there's also infinite love. She was seeing that infinite love is so infinite that it actually excludes the existence of anything other than this love and its expression. I think that it's easy to see that with a starting point of being this infinite, unopposed love, we may need to rethink who we are. The standard way of thinking is that 
We're physical human beings who are, who are evolving physically in a physical universe that itself is evolving physically. But the first thing that we can say right off is that in truth, each of us simply shines eternally as the expression of this pure, infinite love. And that therefore, identity isn't subject to being diminished. Identity isn't subject to being attacked. Identity isn't subject to being divided, one person against another. Identity isn't subject to being contaminated. Here's an analogy to help you see more clearly what I mean. Think of a building with three stories, so the ground floor, the first story, and the second story. Each story is going to represent a concept of identity, a concept of who we are. The ground floor could stand for a sense of identity as being exclusively physical. So the person is shaped by the genes of his or her parents, by first experiences that the person has, later by other experiences. The person is composed of atoms and chemicals, and the person lives a certain number of years. Hopefully, the person loves at least a little bit. And then the person is no more. That's one concept of identity. The first floor could stand for a sense of identity that is essentially physical, so the person is living physically. But then, in addition, there's a soul inside the body. So the body lives a certain number of years, and then the body is no more. But the soul survives, although, unfortunately, nobody actually knows in exactly what form. But I wanted to talk to you about a third concept of identity. You could say the second story. According to this sense of identity, we're purely spiritual as the very expressions of this infinite, unopposed love. And what defines us, what makes us who we are, is not how tall we are, or our age, or even the color of our skin. What makes us who we are is each of us is a unique expression, a unique embodiment of the qualities of this infinite, unopposed love. Qualities like joy, wisdom, generosity, goodness. It's from this third concept of who we are that all good simply flows into human existence. It's because we're intelligent as expressions of this infinite love. That's why we can show forth that intelligence by doing our jobs better. It's because we're strong and loving as expressions of this infinite love. That's why we can show forth that strength and that love by being better parents, by being better grandparents. It's because wholeness and wellness is built right into who we are as expressions of this infinite love. That's why we can show forth that wholeness and that wellness by being healthy. If we're purely spiritual, how do you explain those other two concepts? The first thing that we can say is that seen from an absolute point of view, they have no actual reality. They're simply human perceptions. They're simply human beliefs. They're simply human concepts. But these human concepts are neither created by this divine, infinite, unopposed love, nor could they even be known to this infinite love. And in fact, these human concepts have no actual substance. That said, the human appearance of things our highest collective perception of God's creation can't help but reflect in some measure the beauty of spiritual life. So all of the beautiful things about human existence, and I mentioned just a few of those things at the start of the talk, are to be cherished, appreciated, celebrated, loved, 
not because they represent the absolute spiritual reality that Mary Baker Eddy found in the scriptures, but because even as a human perception of things, they have great value. And as we grow spiritually, all of the beautiful things about human existence become more beautiful as we see them in a more spiritual way. While all of the bad things about human existence simply step by step disappear because we come to see they, they don't actually have anything holding them in place. They, they, they're not actually grounded in anything. They, 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 they're not resting on any principle. We, on the other hand, are rooted and grounded, absolutely anchored in the infinitude of this love. And that's why we exist in complete security and safety. That's why our perfection is always intact. That's why we can prove that our perfection is always intact by overcoming sin, for example. And in Christian science, it's very important to overcome sin. But we overcome sin not as a part of identity, but as a lie about identity, as a lie about identity, because identity is perfect, as perfect as this pure infinite love is perfect. So therefore, sin must be a lie about the, the person. It can't be the truth about identity. When a dog comes out of a lake or a river, what does the dog do? Well, dog shakes himself off to be free of the water, right? Well, the water is no part of the dog, right? In the same way, sin is no part of us. It can't be. It just isn't. Because identity is the reflection of this infinite love. There's a passage in the Bible that says essentially that. And I'm reading from the New Revised Standard Version of the Bible. This is from Ephesians. And this is what it says. It says, you were taught to put away your former way of life, your old self, corrupt and deluded by its lusts, and to be renewed in the spirit of your minds, and to clothe yourselves with the new self, created according to the likeness of God, in true righteousness and holiness. Now that's the self that we really are. That's what defines us, is that true righteousness and holiness. The person who, throughout all human history, has best shown forth that true righteousness and holiness was Jesus. When we read the Gospels, it seems as if Jesus was always feeling his oneness with God. It seems as if Jesus was always seeking the will of God and, and accomplishing the, the will of God. I think that it was for that reason that Jesus was unafraid to reach out and touch the man who was filled with leprosy and to bring him healing, even as he brought healing to so many others. And not only did Jesus heal people, he also reformed them. He reformed them by seeing them in the light of the infinitude of this love, seeing their perfection, seeing their wholeness and their goodness that they would always have as children of God. Jesus showed forth perfectly the Christ. The Christ is the true idea of God as infinite, unopposed love. The Christ existed before Jesus, and Jesus embodied perfectly the Christ. But the Christ is right here with us in this room. It's right wherever each of us is at this moment, now and always. It's the Christ that is always with us to encourage us. It's the Christ that's always with us to strengthen us and awaken us to our true sense of who we are. It's the Christ that heals us. That was the experience of a friend of mine. The year was 1984, and she was in the hospital deciding what to do. 
because she had just received a very serious diagnosis. Uh, the doctors had discovered a number of tumors in her abdomen. The doctors hardly knew what to recommend in, in terms of treatment. They thought maybe an exploratory operation and then maybe chemotherapy, but they didn't hold out much hope that she would be living much longer. So she was in the hospital, but she wasn't receiving any medical treatment. What she was doing was she was praying, uh, she was studying the Bible, she was studying science and health. Uh, she was also receiving help from a Christian science practitioner. Together they were striving to see the perfection that she would always have as the daughter of God, the health that would always be hers as the very reflection of this infinite love. Her husband, the very dearest of men, practically begged her to have the operation. So she decided to go forward with it. But this time, the doctors didn't find one single tumor. In fact, their words to her after the operation were, you're clean as a baby. She was completely healed. This healing happened in 1984. My friend is very active in her church. She's very active in her family. She has a wonderful circle of friends. You can hardly imagine her gratitude. Thinking this way, God is absolutely perfect. Each of us is absolutely perfect as God's reflection. Sometimes can take a certain discipline. Perhaps you have a neighbor who just gets mad at you and you have no idea why. It requires perhaps a certain discipline to not react, but to turn to God in prayer to see that neighbor in the light of God's own perfection. Or perhaps you have a family member who for the last several decades has had a, a, a behavior that's been so difficult for the rest of the family. It requires perhaps a certain discipline to continue to love that person, to continue to support that person, even as they reform and, and stop that problematical behavior. So I'm being quite frank when I tell you, thinking this way is not always easy. But I'm also being very frank when I tell you, this is a path of great joy. And this is a path that, though sometimes it takes work, it is worth it. Time and again, I've seen this kind of healing bring this kind of thinking, bring healing to individuals and to families. I think that thinking like this in the midst of a pandemic, or even in the time when we're recovering from a pandemic, can require a certain amount of discipline. And we might even ask ourselves if thinking like this is responsible in the midst of a contagious disease? The answer to that question is yes. It's that Christian science isn't practiced in isolation. Christian science teaches that we are to put our arms around the whole world in prayer and be uplifted with the whole world in prayer. Christian science teaches a warm appreciation of everything good humanly. That certainly includes an appreciation of the nurse who spends long hours at the hospital caring for others. That certainly includes an appreciation of our fellow citizens who uh, would respond to the, that uh, a request to practice physical distancing, for example. That would certainly mean an appreciation of the elected official who's able to communicate necessary piece of information, a necessary piece of information in a way that actually encourages people. In my own life, I've definitely found that thinking this way can provide a protection. I think I've traveled to 33 or 34 countries around the world, often to countries that where the, the, the level of public sanitation is not that high. I think I've been to Brazil five or six times. I can remember being in Beira, Mozambique, uh, some years ago when 
that city was being very challenged with malaria. But when I travel to these places, it hasn't been with my eyes closed. It's been with my eyes open to see the protecting power of this infinite love. And what I've experienced, at least in some measure, is that to the degree one's thought is simply filled with love and goodwill, there's simply no room left over for fear or even for the image of a disease. And in a sense, the person becomes, the person who's practicing this way of, of, of expressing God, the person becomes kind of, you could say, a law of protection to him or herself. I remember two years ago, I was just finishing a lecture tour in Africa. And uh, this was in March of 2000. And the pandemic was just beginning. Uh, and I had just finished speaking in Nigeria. And my throat had become quite sore. So I asked a friend of mine who is a Christian scientist to pray for me. This was a Sunday. Later that night, I received an instant message from a family member in Canada saying that the Canadian government was asking that all Canadians return to Canada as quickly as possible while there were still commercial airlines in operation. I prayed about it through the night and decided to do my best to come back as quickly as I could. Monday morning, my throat was still sore, so I asked my friend to please continue praying for me. That was a moment of very uncertain physical circumstances for me. Very uncertain human circumstances. Would I be able to find flights between Lagos, Nigeria and Ottawa, Canada? Would I be well enough to travel? Or would I have to spend weeks or even months in a hotel room far from home? I wanted to travel, I wanted, of course, to be well, but even more important, I wanted to practice the golden rule, to do unto others as you would have them do unto you, which is what Jesus taught, simply the practical ethics of the New Testament. So if a Christian scientist is sick with a contagious disease, and if it's necessary to communicate that information in order to protect others, that's what he or she does. It's simply being loving and Christian. So if that were necessary, I definitely would have done that. I began to pray. Well, I was praying before, but the, as I was praying, the two main ideas with which I was praying were these. First, that everything I get, I get directly and exclusively from God. Just like a ray of light from the sun gets everything directly and exclusively from the sun, not from the other rays. And of course, all that I can in truth ever get from God is good. Just like in truth, all that everybody could really ever get from God is good. The second idea with which I prayed is that my home wasn't a geographical location. My home is the consciousness of this infinite unopposed love. And I knew that I had that consciousness. And I knew that therefore, in some way, I could demonstrate that. I began to try to call the airlines, but in March of 2020, getting through to the airlines by phone was almost impossible. So I began looking online after praying and a fair bit of work, I found an itinerary that would have me leaving the next day. It would be two consecutive days of travel. I would be in a total of five cities altogether uh, in four countries. But it seemed realistic. So I purchased the ticket. And I spent the rest of that day, the rest of that Monday, praying for myself and praying for the world. I woke up Tuesday morning feeling just fine. 
I was able to thank my friend for his prayers. I left the hotel early in the morning. I passed you know, through all of the airports and all of the planes. I obeyed meticulously all of the requirements that were in place at that time. And I returned home uh, in Ottawa very late Wednesday night and very happy. And then I self-isolated for two weeks, which was what the Canadian government was asking people to do if they had come from abroad. I wanted to recount this experience so that you would have confidence wherever life finds you, even in the midst of a pandemic, or whatever challenges you might have, you can maintain that idea of perfect God and each of us perfect as the reflection of God. As you do that, you will be guided. You will uh, be guided to, be, to treat others in an ethical way. And if healing is the necessity, you will find that healing as well. Sometimes, thinking this way can almost change the human character of the person. That was the experience of a friend of mine who learned of Christian science when he was a teenager. He came from a family that didn't have much money, and he hardly knew his father. His father was not really present in his life. And one of my friend's favorite activities was going out and drinking with his buddies. But he had a neighbor who was a Christian scientist. He liked this neighbor. The man was a quiet man. He was definitely a person of integrity. He definitely had a lot of trust in God. One day, this neighbor invited him to go with him to his Christian science church. And in Christian science churches, there's Sunday school for young people up to age 20. In effect, then, it was an invitation to go to Sunday school in that church. My friend thought about it and accepted the invitation. And what he heard in that Christian Science Sunday School had a great impact on him because he heard for the very first time that he has a perfect father-mother God, infinite love, and that he's a perfect son of this perfect father-mother God. He loved that idea. He loved that idea so much that he began attending that Sunday school regularly. And it wasn't long before the ideas of Christian science were beginning to change the way he was thinking about himself, beginning to change the way that he wanted to live. There were a number of changes. One of them was he really liked his friends. But he decided he didn't want to drink anymore. So he stopped drinking. And then a way opened up for him to be able to go to university. Now, this was surprising. He came from a family who didn't have much money. This, as a matter of fact, was in the United States, where university, most, in most cases, costs a lot of money. He was accepted into a program. He was thrilled at that he worked very hard uh, on his studies. But I believe, in a sense, he worked even harder on himself. He wanted to express so much love towards the other students, so much love towards the professors, towards everybody. Fast forwarding now, maybe eight years, he graduated. He has a job that's just right for him. He's very active in his community. He and his wife have a little boy. I think what, a, what impresses me most in, this, in his case was, no, not that he went to university and now has a job that's just right for him. What impresses me most is this idea of God as being infinite father-mother love has enriched his life so much. And now he, through the way he's living through the way he's interacting with others is enriching the lives of others. His life has a moral and a spiritual orientation that it just never had before. 
I can hardly think of my friend without thinking of the Ten Commandments. We probably all know in some degree the Ten Commandments that are found in the Bible book of Exodus. They were, the Bible says that the Ten Commandments were given by God to Moses. The Ten Commandments were very important in the ministry of Jesus. The Ten Commandments have been very important in the evolution of humanity. The very first commandment, to have no gods before me. To me, that means to recognize this infinite love and to live in harmony with this love. The next commandment, to uh, have no graven images. Often we might think of a graven image as being a, you know, a, a statue that a person might bow down to. But sometimes graven images can be purely mental. Even a pandemic itself, in a sense, is a kind of a, an image, a mental image, that we need not worship. Uh, the next commandment, to not take the name of God in vain, that certainly means to speak politely and not to swear. But I love to think of it as meaning to not take the nature of God in vain as pure infinite love. But again, to live in harmony with this infinite love. The next commandment, remember the Sabbath and keep it holy. I love to go to church on Sunday, but I also love to think of my own holiness and the holiness of everybody around me each day of the week. The next commandment, honor thy father and thy mother. It, it just makes good sense to honor everything that's good in our parents, even as we honor everything that's good in everybody. The next commandment, to not kill, obviously important, literally. But sometimes people kind of kill, you could say in another way, maybe a teacher is entertaining a very limited concept of the capacities of a student, for example. The next commandment, to not commit adultery, that certainly means to be faithful in your marriage, it certainly means to have pure, clean thoughts. I love to think of it as meaning as well to always be dependable in every relationship. If you say you're going to do something, you do it. You follow through. The next commandment um, to uh, not bear, uh, uh, pardon me, the next commandment to not steal, uh, and that's logical. As we recognize that we have all good from God, just like every ray of light from the sun has everything directly and exclusively from the sun, we feel no need to steal. The next commandment to not bear false testimony, that means to always tell the truth. And in Christian science, it's very important to be a person of substance, a person who always tells the truth. Truth is a synonym for God in Christian science. So it's very important to be an honest person, to be a person of integrity. Uh, the last commandment, to not covet. Again, as we recognize that we have infinite good from God, there is no reason for us to want something that belongs to somebody else. I mentioned that the Ten Commandments have been very important in the evolution of humanity. And I think that one of the reasons for that is, in a sense, the Ten Commandments define identity. For example, the daughter of God has no limited concept of her capacities, has no such image of herself. But the daughter of God has great confidence that she can do whatever God would have her do for the glory of God. The Son of God has no desire to steal because he recognizes that God gives each of us infinite good. The little boy who's 10 years old, I'm persuaded, wants to tell the truth. Why? It's his nature. It's simply who he is. So the Ten Commandments define who we are. The Ten Commandments never judge us. The Ten Commandments never condemn us. The Ten Commandments always support us in our showing forth our true spiritual nature as manifestations of this infinite love. I mentioned that the Son of God always has whatever he needs. The daughter of God always has whatever she needs. That was the experience of a friend of mine who, with his family, made a long cross-country move 
to accept a job. And things were going smoothly until there were changes in the organization. And then that job disappeared. So my friend didn't have a job. What he did have was a mortgage, a wife, and two small children. It was a serious situation. Perhaps a little bit like the situation for some people in the northern part of England or in other parts of the UK or in other parts of the world where honestly, they didn't know how things were going to work out for them financially. My friend prayed, but he didn't start his prayers with what he didn't have. He started his prayers with what he understood about the nature of God. He thought about just how great God's love is for him, for his wife, and for his two precious children. And then he came to have just a great sense of peace. In fact, the idea occurred to him that it would be be actually impossible for God not to meet their needs because of just how much God loved them. He didn't know how things would work out, but he was confident that they would. Not long after that, he was offered a job. This job was going to require that he learn new skills, that he develop new capacities, but he was confident that with God, he could do that work. Now, maybe six or seven years later, he's done very well at that job. The organization has been blessed. His family has been blessed. Um, the whole experience confirmed for him that the love of God would always be there for him and for his family. The whole experience confirmed for him that the love of God would always be there for every individual and for every family. You might ask yourself, does Christian science always heal? That's a good question. Mary Baker Eddy discovered Christian science in 1866. Since then, those applying this system of healing have faced the same problems as the rest of humanity, including the same health problems. In some cases, they've been healed immediately. In other cases, they haven't. But the overall record of Christian science is a very strong record of healing indeed. Mary Baker Eddy went on to found the Church of Christ Scientists that has branches in many countries around the world. She served as the pastor of the church, as the pastor emeritus of the church. She founded a series of magazines, including the Christian Science Journal, which is published monthly. The Herald of Christian Science is also a monthly magazine. And, the Christian, and the, the Christian Science Sentinel, which is published weekly. In each and every one of these magazines, in each and every issue, since well more than a century now, have been published verified testimonies of healing. Healings of a wide range of illnesses, everything from blindness to AIDS, healings of cancers, of Alzheimer's, um, healings of eating disorders, uh, healings of addictions, healings even of broken bones. When you read these healings, it feels a little bit like reading the Gospels, which are filled with the healing works of Jesus and his disciples. Up until now, some 65,000 such healings have been published. And in Christian Science churches around the world, there are Wednesday testimony meetings when people tell about how applying Christian Science has brought healing to their own lives and to the lives of their families. In many cases, human thought is on that ground floor level or on the level of the first story. But healing always happens to the degree 
we realize our purely spiritual nature. And sometimes working to see our pure, purely spiritual nature is work and is discipline. But again, it's also a joy. And it is a wonderful privilege to be able to follow the perfect example of Jesus. Up until now, all of the examples that I've given have been of individuals or individuals and their families. But I wanted to give an example of how to pray for the collectivity. This could be for your own community, so that there could be, I don't know, um, more affordable housing. It could be to try and solve a problem like homelessness. It could be praying for a world problem, such as overcoming racism. This was the experience of a friend of mine in a developing country. He accepted a job as the financial controller of a large government institution, an institution that employed more than 1,400 people. But after two or three months, he came to realize that corruption within that institution was an enormous problem. That corruption was taking several forms. One was people were manipulating the computer system with the collaboration of the cashiers of, to, in order to rob the organization. There was the um, issuing of false receipts. There was even the outright theft of equipment. My friend wanted the institution to truly be serving its clients. He wanted the accounting to be in conformity with national and international standards. He wanted the institution to be free of corruption. So he took a number of steps. He modernized the accounting system. He implemented a sort of an internal auditing system. He improved the inventory system, and he began to work to increase employee salaries. But most especially, most especially, he prayed. He prayed that his eyes would be opened to see the integrity, the honesty, the innocence of each and every one of those employees. My friend's efforts to reform the organization were met with stiff resistance. That resistance took a number of forms. One of them was there was a group of employees who wrote a false report about my friend and then sent that report off to his immediate superior and to the minister of finance in his country. All of the accusations were investigated None of them were true. My friend's innocence was recognized. He kept on praying. And then, sometime after that, a colleague of his, a friend, told him that he had inadvertently overheard a conversation between two other employees. And the two other employees had said that, really, there was just one way to stop these reforms. And that was to eliminate my friend using witchcraft. Now, I should say that in some countries around the world, in some cultures around the world, witchcraft is a way of seeking to personally control another person. I'm not sure about here in the UK, but in Canada, we have our own ways of doing that. That can be like a campaign of lies, that can be backstabbing, that can be um, backbiting. So, Every culture has its own ways of seeking to get at the other person, okay, in a work setting. In this culture, it was um, witchcraft. My friend heard that, but was unimpressed. He just kept on praying. Not long after that, he was alone in the office one Saturday, working. And suddenly, he felt a very sharp pain. And a part of his body seemed paralyzed. 
he recognized right away that this was impersonal resistance to these reforms that were going to bless everybody. He prayed. Specifically, he prayed with this passage from Science and Health. It says here, your influence for good depends upon the weight you throw into the right scale. The good you do and embody gives you the only power obtainable. He knew that he was embodying good. He knew that his only motivation was to allow that organization to truly serve the people that it was set up to serve. It took him a couple of days of steadfast prayer, but the pain stopped completely, and he was able to move normally. He kept on praying. By this time, the administration had assigned a couple of security guards to protect him because he'd received direct threats. But he was unfazed. He was so confident in knowing there's nothing apart from this infinite love and its expression. Then something truly wonderful happened. His colleagues, the same level as him within the organization, instead of just saying, oh yes, if you want to do those reforms, you go ahead, instead of just being indifferent like that to them, finally, they began to support those reforms. And it wasn't long after that that all the employees were supporting the reforms. My friend could see that it was the case because he could see it in the internal audits could see it in the inventory. It was a great victory, certainly for my friend. It was a great victory for that institution. Managers from other government institutions came to him to say, how did you do that? How did that? So it was a great victory for that institution in a country which has often been challenged by corruption. I don't think my friend ever once had the thought, oh, I'm just one person. What good will my prayers do? He didn't think like that. He just didn't. His confidence wasn't in him personally. His confidence was in the very nature of reality itself, this one infinite love filling all space. I wanted to read you one last passage from Science and Health. This is a profound passage about identity that is read towards the end of every Christian Science Sunday service. And in fact, it's the very last thing that is read in Christian Science Sunday School sessions. In it, the author uses the term man to mean men and women in their true spiritual nature as children of God. This is the passage. There is no life, truth, intelligence, nor substance in matter. All is infinite mind and its infinite manifestation, for God is all in all. Spirit is immortal truth. Matter is mortal error. Spirit is the real and eternal. Matter is the unreal and temporal. Spirit is God, and man is his image and likeness. Therefore, man is not material, he is spiritual. Let me summarize. I gave you some background information about Mary Baker Eddy about how she found in the scriptures a sense of God as being infinite, unopposed love, the only substance of the universe. How she found a sense of identity as being the expression of this love, each of us being the very image of this love. How this true sense of who God is, this true sense of who we are, comes to each of us wherever we are in human experience to comfort us, to strengthen us, to encourage us. 
It comes to heal us. It comes to redeem us. And it comes to redeem all humanity. I wanted you to have confidence that if you're praying about something in your family, if you're praying about uh, something that's, uh, as I say, a world problem, could be global climate change, if you're, uh, whatever you're praying for, that you can be confident that the basis of your confidence is not who you are personally, or not even that you're one person and another. No, the basis of your confidence is the reality and the substantiality of this love, and that it's this love who defines each of us in truth eternally. My friend, who had lost his job, didn't start his prayers with what he didn't have. He started his prayers with God, just like the Lord's Prayer starts, Our Father. So that's the way we start our prayers. We start with what we're seeing and knowing as, as children of God. And, of course, our prayers are effective to the degree we live consistently with those prayers. So, for example, let's say that we're praying for greater honesty and greater integrity amongst elected officials in our own country or in another country. Our prayers in that direction are going to be effective to the degree we live that honesty and that integrity. It's the way we live our lives. That's what gives power and authority to our prayers. Just like it would be the money that you would have in your bank account that means that your check is accepted as valid and doesn't bounce because you have the funds. In the same way, it's the way that we're living. That's what gives power to our prayers. When my friend was praying for that government institution that was corrupt, I'm can, you can be pretty sure it was the way he was living. That was what gave power to those prayers. That's what made those prayers potent. I wanted to heartily recommend a, an in-depth study of the Bible as a way of coming to see even more clearly your spiritual nature. I wanted to heartily recommend an in-depth study of this book, Science and Health with Key to the Scriptures. And well, looking online or here, you might see a different cover, but it's, it's the same book. Uh, I wanted to heartily recommend an in-depth study of Science and Health with Key to the Scriptures as a way of grasping even more the Scriptures in their practical and spiritual meaning. I wanted to again thank this church for offering this community uh, offering this lecture to this community and to the wider community over the internet. And lastly, I wanted to thank each of you for your presence, for your participation, and for your kind attention. Thank you.